The Story of Civilization, Part 2, The Life of Greece, Being a History of Greek Civilization from the Beginnings, and of Civilization in the Near East, from the Death of Alexander to the Roman Conquest, with an Introduction on the Prehistoric Culture of Crete by Will Durant, Chapter 7, The Greeks in the West, Section 6, The Greeks in Africa. The Carthaginians had reason to be disturbed, for even on the north coast of Africa, the Greeks had established cities and were capturing trade. As early as 630 BCE, the Dorians of Thera had sent a numerous colony to Kerena, midway between Carthaga and Egypt. There, on the desert's edge, they found good soil, with rain so abundant that the natives spoke of the site as the place where there was a hole in the sky. The Greeks used part of the land to pasturage and exported wool and hides. They grew from the Silphium plant, the spice that all Greece was eager to buy. They sold Greek products to Africa and developed their own handicrafts to such a point that Karenaic vases ranked among the best. They used its wealth intelligently and adorned itself with great gardens, temples, statuary, and gymnasiums. Here, the first famous Epicurean philosopher, Aristippus, was born, and here, after much wandering, he returned to found the Karenaic school and the Silphium plant. Isn't that one that's like extinct? And isn't it one that was thought to be of birth control purposes too? Within Egypt itself, normally hostile to any foreign settlement. The Greeks gained a foothold, at last an empire. About 650 BCE, the Milesians opened a factory, or trading post at Naukratis on the Canopic branch of the Nile. Pharaoh Samtik I tolerated them because they made good mercenaries, while their commerce provided rich prey for his collectors of custom revenues. Ahmosis II gave them a large measure of self-government. Naukratis became almost an industrial city with manufacturers of pottery, terracotta, and faience. Fiance. Still, more became an emporium of trade, bringing in Greek oil, and wine, and sending out Egyptian wheat, linen, and wool, African ivory, frankincense, and gold. Gradually, amid these exchanges of Egyptian lore and techniques in religion, for example, nowadays we talk of, and use the term grimoire, it's, it's about techniques of experience, of performance of pleasing the divine or whatever entity that the person's working with. Architecture, sculpture, and science flowed into Greece, while in return, Greek words and ways entered Egypt and paved the way for Greek domination in the Alexandrian age. Now, it wasn't called Egypt until the Greeks named it Agaptos, right? Is that how you spell it? If, in imagination, we take a merchant vessel from Naucratis to Athens, our tour of the Greek world will be complete. It was necessary that we should make this long circuit in order that we might see and feel the extent and variety of Hellenic civilization. Aristotle described the constitutional history of 158 Greek city-states, but there were a thousand more. Each contributed in commerce, industry, and thought to what we mean by Greece. 
in the colonies rather than on the mainland of Boring Greek. Poetry and prose, mathematics and metaphysics, oratory and history. Without them and the thousand observing tentacles which they stretched out into the old world, Greek civilization, the most precious products in history, might never have been. Through them, the cultures of Egypt and the Orient passed into Greece, and Greek culture spread slowly into Asia, Africa, and Europe. Now, at one point, they just said two continents, and, well, I mean, they divided it into two. And so on the other side of Afghanistan was the one side, and Africa and Europe was the other side. But Africa doesn't get... Well, it was known as uh, Ethiopic because of their brown and black skin. Um, and they were... Um, Africa, I think, was another similar term that just referred to the southern side of the Mediterranean that was on that side. 